Oh. So, I suppose one of the things I take issue with is attempts to make everything look scientific. And one of the reasons for that is, if you think about it, as soon as you give people in business or in public policy the idea that what they're doing should be scientific, they immediately harken back to their time at school and they think, I remember science. It was the time when, uh, unlike English or history, everything had a single right answer. And if you weren't right, it was wrong. And I've increasingly come to the idea that trying to make real life things purely scientific in that same way uh, may be leading us badly astray. And part of the reason for that is um, not only, I would argue, in many, many marketing or psychological uh, areas is there not a single right answer. It's even weirder than that, that sometimes in physics, the opposite of right is wrong, okay, broadly speaking. Um, in solving problems in terms of human psychology, weirdly, the opposite of a good idea may not be wrong, it may be another good idea. Because depending on the frame, depending on the context we bring to bear to anything, something could be good or bad, not dependent on what it is, but simply on how we perceive it. Now, a lot of people, by the way, I, I want to just warn you of this, a lot of people get really uncomfortable with this because they think it's cheating. Okay, And it kind of is cheating in a funny kind of way. Uh, you can call it cheating or you can call it magic. You can frame it either way. And funnily enough, the person who introduced me to this, strange given that I work in advertising, was actually my brother, uh, who's an astrophysicist. And he said, no, 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 there are two things you can do if you want to sell a car. You can either have cloth seats, okay, and um, replace them with leather seats and charge more for the car. Or you can charge more for the car keep the cloth seats, and run an advertising campaign that convinces people that cloth seats are cool. OK? And he said, as long as you accept that value is subjective, they're both equally valid. Now, you might argue, by the way, interestingly, that the second one is environmentally more friendly than the first. It's interesting, too, that I mentioned cloth seats because uh, Daniel Kahneman uh, is uh, seemingly obsessed with cloth seats. Uh, he's convinced that leather is simply... I'm not sure he's right on this. I did take issue with Daniel Kahneman, Nobel Prize winning economist, though he is, on the, on the grounds of leather versus cloth seats, saying, um, yes, cloth seats, you're absolutely right, Daniel, they are superior to leather in many, many ways, but if you've had a child vomit on cloth seats, you discover the benefits of le leather very quickly indeed. I don't, I don't think Daniel Kahneman's in the business of vomiting in his own car. I think those days are behind him. But... It's an absolutely fair point. And this is why it gets so complicated. So my case against rationality starts in the book with a very, very simple thought experiment about how a rational person might think about competing with Coca-Cola. And you'd sit in the room and you go, OK, for about 120 years or so, Coke's been the best-selling cold, non-alcoholic drink in the world, uh, apart from water. OK, how can we get a bit of that action? And the three, four logical people sitting in the room would say, well, it seems to me what we need to do is we need to produce a drink that tastes nicer than Coke, uh, costs less than Coke, and comes in a really big can so people get great value for money. Now, no one would get fired if you tried that and failed because you never get fired for being logical. It's a fundamental bias in business decision making. If you do something logical and it fails, you keep your job. Okay? If you do something illogical and it fails, you're dead. Okay? So there's a very, very strong bias in business, not towards taking good decisions, but towards taking decisions that are very easy to defend. And so the natural inclination of anybody in a business meeting, unless you have someone like me in there who's feeling mischievous and has permission to cause trouble, is to say, OK, we want this drink. It needs to taste nicer than Coke, cost less than Coke, and come in a really big can or bottle. And everybody would nod along, and you'd go and research it, and people would say, yes, this tastes very good. In fact, I might even say it tastes nicer than Coke. The only problem is that no one's actually succeeded with that approach in 100 years. On the other hand, the most successful attempt to compete with Coca-Cola by miles is Red Bull. And it comes in a tiny can, it costs a fortune, and it tastes disgusting. Okay. Now, when I say it tastes disgusting, that's not a subjective opinion. They researched it, and they went to a company which only researches, I promise this exists, it only researches the taste of carbonated drinks. And they asked people, 
what do you think of this drink? We're thinking of launching this drink. What do you think? And normally, the research would come back with a failed product. They actually said, this is the worst drink we have researched in the entire history of our company. Normally, research respondents would say something like, oh, it's a bit sweet for me, it's more for kids, a bit cloying, not really my thing. No, no. In this case, they came back with phrases like, I wouldn't drink this piss if you paid me. Okay. <laughs> and yet, weirdly, the drink is so successful that they can basically run a Formula One team you know, on the profits for the lols, okay? That's how successful it is. Now, what I mean by that is the opposite of a good idea is sometimes another good idea. That's what's weird about psychology, that actually the way we perceive the world is neither linear nor is it necessarily monotonic. Uh, it's highly contradictory. Now, let me explain why I think Red Bull's successful. It's a post-rationalization, but there's some evidence uh, work conducted by INSEAD to support this, which is it isn't actually a drink in the sense that Fanta's a drink, it's actually a kind of placebo. Or you could say it's a drug, which it also is a kind of drug. Now, if you think about it, if you want a nice drink, you want it to taste nice. That's why Fanta's quite popular. It tastes like orange. We probably have a strong evolutionary propensity to drink things that taste a bit like oranges, OK? On the other hand, once you frame it as something with psychoactive or psychotropic powers, all the rules change. All the things that are a disadvantage as a drink are a strength as a placebo, OK? It's expensive. It comes in a small measured dose, which suggests to our unconscious that it's really, really potent. And it tastes weird. Now, if you think about it, nearly all drugs taste weird. In fact, you know, nobody wants to be given some sort of prescription for, say, um, uh, you know, what, what would an example of uh, a prescription for a serious condition be asked, you know, do you want the black currant or the strawberry flavour, right? We kind of believe that things that have medicinal powers should taste weird. And as a result, I think Red Bull's a very, very disastrously bad drink, but it's an incredibly potent placebo. If you think about it, you know, the small can says, you know, they actually had to dose this out in a especially small can, because if you had the full 330 millilitres, you'd probably go postal. You know, that's the, that's the kind of implication. Okay. It even has the most fantastic placebo effect in the UK, which is you can't buy it if you're under 16. Now, if there's a way to want make 15-year-olds want something, it's to basically allow it only to be sold to people over a certain age. And I don't know if anybody remembers, does, did this ever exist in Canada, a thing called Sonatogen, which was a tonic wine? It existed in the UK in my childhood. It was a very, very sweet tonic wine. Now, I think a tonic wine really existed for people who were sort of Presbyterians, but mildly alcoholic, and could get away with it by pretending to be ill. To be, that, that's my suspicion, OK? But the interesting thing is, the last ingredient they added to this very sweet tonic wine uh, was a weird chemical, the only purpose of which was to taste not very nice. And the argument for this was, if we don't make it taste a bit weird, OK, no one will believe it's medicinal. Um, if you're bemused, by the way, by the coexistence of Diet Coke and Coke Zero, uh, there's something similar going on, which is the reason you have to have Coke Zero and Diet Coke is Coke Zero is designed to taste pretty much exactly like normal Coke. Okay? Diet Coke has to be made to taste a little bit more bitter than ordinary Coke because otherwise people don't believe it's a diet drink. And these weird mental inferences, unconscious mental inferences, are basically all over the place. So I'll give you a few examples. Wine tastes better if you pour it from a heavier bottle. Wine tastes better if you tell people it's expensive. Painkillers are more effective if they're branded. Um, uh, Painkillers are more effective if they're expensive, by the way, or if you tell people they're expensive. I'm the only person in the UK who campaigns against the fact that you can't buy expensive aspirin anymore because we've entirely genericized the production of aspirin. There's no branded aspirin. And my argument is, this isn't going to work. I haven't got an 89p headache. I've got a £3.50 headache, for God's sake, right? Funnily enough, um, uh, the makers of Nurofen got into huge trouble with these boring people at the Australian Competition Commission because they were charging a premium for Nurofen, which was chemically identical to the ordinary Nurofen, but was more expensive because the packaging made a promise 
that it was effective against a more specific kind of condition. So there was neurofin for period pain, neurofin for cold and flu, neurofin for something else, and they charged more for these, even though chemically the active ingredients were no different for bog standard neurofin. Now, I was willing, I wasn't called upon to give evidence, I was willing to support them in this complete fraud <laughs> on the grounds that, tragic but true, Writing neurofen for period pain on the packaging and charging a bit more for it would make the drug more effective against period pain. Okay. I actually said they weren't going far enough. I said they should have had, I've lost my car keys, neurofen, and neurofen for people whose neighbours like reggae. You know, I thought you could, have gone, you could have gone much deeper with this whole idea of specific annoyances. But actually, if you say it's for a specific thing, on the packaging, and you charge a bit more for it, the placebo effect means that actually it's a more effective painkiller. So yes, to some extent, there was a degree of deception going on, but they were only deceiving your conscious mind. Your unconscious was weirdly happy to play along with the deception. And so I suppose I became weirdly and accidentally famous because of a TED talk I gave in about 2007, where I just made this point about how when you're trying to improve something, generally there's an engineering solution and there's a psychological solution. And we tend to regard the engineering solution as honest, decent, and fair because it improves objective metrics. And we regard the psychological solution as a bit of a con. And my view is that, taken to extremes, this is a very dangerous and false dichotomy. And it all started with a kind of joke which was, at the time, the UK was planning to spend £6 billion creating fast railway lines between London and the coast at Folkestone to reduce the Eurostar journey time between Paris and London from about 3 hours and 10 minutes down to about 2 hours and 40. And I simply made the point that, yes, you could do this, you could have a budget of £6 billion, and you could sort of improve the Eurostar experience a bit by making it faster. And that's what every engineer would do. They'd say, we have to improve the objective characteristics of this journey, speed, distance, capacity, all those kind of things. And I said, that isn't necessarily true. I said, you could take 1% of that budget and you could just put Wi-Fi on the trains. Now, I argued that that wouldn't reduce the, the duration of the journey, but it would massively transform the usefulness of the time. Or indeed, the level of entertainment of the time. You might be working on the train if you're going to a business meeting. You might be watching a film. It doesn't really matter, OK? Now, the fact that humans do not react to time objectively, I think is actually proved linguistically. We have phrases like, it was the longest 10 minutes of my life. You know, or, for example, time flies when you're having fun. That our perception of time is not at that of a metronome or a ticking clock. You know, whether something feels like a long time or something feels like a short time is dependent on lots of things, including the mood we're in, OK? And so I took that a bit further and said, if you think adding Wi-Fi to the trains is too boring and inexpensive, I said, why don't you just take another billion pounds from your six billion budget, employ all of the world's top male and, su and female supermodels, get them to walk up and down the train f serving free glasses of Chateau Petrus to all the passengers. I said, not only will you still have saved £5 billion compared to the engineering solution, but people will ask for the trains to be slowed down. <laughs> and it's very, very interesting, because if you think about it, we're trying to improve the world. Engineers will always try and improve the world objectively on the assumption that an objective improvement is a subjective improvement. And I think quite often that's actually wrong. First of all, I think the subjective improvement might be a lot cheaper. It might be a lot easier. It might be more environmentally friendly, by the way, because generally making people cheerful and allowing them to watch films on a train is going to use less uh, non-renewable resources than making a train faster or building new trains. But also, of course, it's worth remembering that our enjoyment of the world isn't really much dependent beyond a certain point on things like how long a train journey is. How comfortable the seat is, is probably a more important consideration, for instance. Or um, is there a table on the train so I can actually have a cup of coffee and, and use a laptop? Those things start to become more and more important, particularly as you near the limits of reasonable train speed, because you're up against the laws of physics. And as you know, it's not that difficult to get a train that can go 30 to go 60, but getting a train to going from 150 miles an hour to 300 is 
pretty damn difficult because, of course, you have lots of things which are, you know, the square of air resistance or whatever it may be. And at that point, the case for psychological solutions versus physical or engineering solutions, I think, becomes very strong. Uh, it's worth remembering, of course, that all SI units, with one exception, I think, all scientific units of time, distance, weight, etc., cetera, um, are independent of human perception. There's one exception, by the way, which is the lumen, which is the unit of luminosity, where they realize that merely measuring how much, um, how many photons a light source gave out wouldn't be very good unless you weighted it in favor of the visible spectrum. Interestingly, there was debate when they introduced a unit of temperature to say that actually um, we should actually give similar consideration to human perception. Now, you know those American weather forecasts where they go, you know, it's 73 degrees, feels like 68, okay? That's an acknowledgement that what a temperature is and how it feels to us aren't quite the same thing, depending on wind chill, humidity, and a load of facts. And there was weirdly a debate about temperature for a time, at least ambient atmospheric temperature rather than scientific temperature, that said we should do the same thing as with the lumen. We should actually factor in things that actually affected how we felt, not just pure temperature. But they lost that one. And nearly every scientific unit is as perceived by an objective measuring device, not as perceived by a human. And the way we perceive things is hugely different to what they are. And that point I made that actually, you know, in many cases, the opposite of a, of, of a good idea is another good idea. The opposite of the logical solution may also present you with really interesting possibilities, but nobody ever tries them. And those of you who are familiar with marketing will know the story about Betty Crocker cakes, which was an instant cake mix where you simply added water, put the mix on a baking tray, wanged it in the oven, and a cake appeared. And they couldn't sell it. Nobody would buy it. And some psychologists suggested it's too easy. You don't feel you're cooking. You feel you're cheating. You need to create an added degree of difficulty which makes people feel they've actually put something of themselves into the cake. And so the famous cake slogan for Betty Crocker cakes was just add an egg. And it required you to add an egg, which made people feel. I mean, American people of the 1960s you know, obviously had a pretty shallow idea of what cooking was. But when they were actually adding an egg, they actually felt they were bloody on master chef, basically, as opposed to just mixing something with water and putting it in the oven. The addition of an egg, which is sort of wholesome and organic, completely transformed the perception of the thing. And so counterintuitively, making something a bit more difficult sometimes makes it better. Uh, email would be better if it weren't instantaneous, I believe. OK? That actually it never occurred to anybody in Silicon Valley that building in a bit of a buffer. There's nothing worse than trying to get through your emails only to have some bastard reply to the emails you've just replied to. I'm trying to get down to, you know, the weird kind of strange, you know, sludge at the bottom of my inbox. And these bastards keep replying to me. You know, in many ways, actually, emails should probably be deferred. You know, you should be able to send an instantaneous email, but the default should not be instant. OK. Um, and I think, by the way, I think there are a lot of cases where Silicon Valley, it's worth looking at, because they, they, Silicon Valley is actually unintentionally deeply ideological. Uh, that they will always assume that fast is better than slow. They will always assume that, that, that free is better than expensive. They will always assume that l no friction is better than more friction. And actually, um, I'm not sure they're right. I mean, I think the driverless car is a, has the potential to be a disaster, right? Because if driving isn't slightly irritating, OK, right? Who's going to spend all their time in the car? Answer, people who, with no sense of urgency who have a lot of time to spare. So retired bridge players, basically, are just going to sit in Toronto going round and round in circles, not giving a shit, clogging up all the roads, and anybody who's got a meeting to go to is going to be completely stuffed. Now, if you think that driverless cars aren't going to pose a problem, I can prove it, by the way, because I've been to India. Now, in India, they already have driverless cars. Now, they don't actually, right? But in India, a driver is cheaper than a car. So everybody with a car has a driver, which effectively means it's a driverless car. Now, I don't know if you've been to India, but the one thing you won't say if you've been to India is, hey, those guys have really got the congestion problem cracked, <laughs> right? You do not say that after three hours stationary in Mumbai traffic. You don't go, wow, this is the future, right? 
So Silicon Valley actually makes those assumptions. And it's very easy to make logical assumptions because you never get into any trouble if you're wrong. Okay, if you're logical, you never get into any trouble if you're wrong. And so an example was I was having a chat with Dan Ariely, the uh, wonderful book called uh, Predictably Irrational. And we discovered that everybody working for pharmaceutical companies tries to make pills as easy to take as possible, as small as possible, as infrequent as possible, as easy to swallow as possible. And both of us said, whoa, there's a potential problem there. One, you're minimizing the placebo effect, possibly, because you might want to add a degree of difficulty. But actually, with a lot of pills, the most important thing about them is that you remember to take them really regularly. And actually, we said, in many cases, you should probably add a bit of a ritual to the preparation of the medicine every evening so that you don't forget. And also, so that you, you, there's never any ambiguity about whether you've taken your medicine or not. So actually, having medicine which you had to grind up and dilute may be, in some cases, a better solution. IKEA, by the way, very interestingly, also understands this reverse psychology. Uh, Kamprad, who founded IKEA, believes, with I think some justification, that if you're selling cheap furniture, if you make it really easy for people to buy quite nice furniture that's really cheap, they'll tend to assume there's something wrong with the furniture. But if you make it a right royal pain in the arse to buy the stuff and an absolute bull's ache of an afternoon assembling the stuff, then you'll see that the low cost plus the effort destigmatizes the low price. But also he believes that we value the furniture more because of the effort we've invested in both acquiring it and assembling it. That actually, that there's, because it's accompanied by a feeling of accomplishment, we don't just treat it um, lightly or assume that the low cost means that there's something wrong with it. And I think... Um, I think it's just really important to say that this attempt to make everything look scientific may be quite problematic because one of the things I've noticed in business in the last 15, 20 years, particularly since the invention of the spreadsheet, is you can't do anything unless you have an exact case in advance for what's going to happen and how it's going to work and to what extent it'll pay off. Okay. Now, the only problem with that in a complex and unknowable world with a high degree of uncertainty is it completely prevents you from doing anything which is probabilistically worthwhile but not predictable or measurable in advance or not attributable in hindsight. Okay. Now, let me give you an example of this kind of behavior. And I made an argument that there's a perfectly good reason for advertising and that we don't have to get into all this business of ROI and um, uh, cost-benefit analysis and uh, all the other stuff. There's a really good reason to advertise, and it's as simple as this, okay? Um, if you're famous, more lucky shit happens to you than if you're obscure. Now, we can't predict in advance what form that luck will take, nor can we attribute in retrospect all the good luck that actually arose because of our fame, we can't attribute that to a specific marketing activity. But since opportunity and fortune tend to be more positive than negative, it makes sense to maximize them. Now, let me explain to someone who understands this. If I ask my daughters, these aren't my daughters, uh, they're just some random teenagers, but there you go. Okay, if I ask my daughters, I'm 53 and I've got two daughters, they're twins, they're 18, and they insist on going out on a Saturday night, okay? And this is bloody annoying if you're 53, because if you're 53, your idea of a great Saturday night is watching the Discovery Channel in your pants, basically, okay? But when you're 18, this is not your idea of a good Saturday night for some reason. You want to go out to a party. And if I asked my daughters, why do you insist on going out every evening, particularly on Saturdays, they'd basically reply, because I might get lucky. Now, the, the luck might be sexual, romantic. It might be they make a new friend. They get invited on holiday. They get told about a really good job opportunity. They learn some exciting gossip. It might be they get invited to another, even better party the following weekend. Okay? They don't know. They couldn't do a cost-benefit analysis. They couldn't do a spreadsheet saying, um, OK, cost of going to party X, benefit, and list some quantifiable benefits. But they know something perfectly true, which is that if you go out, lucky shit might happen to you. And if you stay home, it won't. Simple as that, OK? Right? You know, you're not going to stay at home and have some sort of weird supermodel bang on the door saying, I've been looking for you, right? <laughs> Nothing really positive is going to happen if you stay at home on a Saturday night. 
And my daughters as teenagers, and of course, at, in, in Darwinian terms, at an age where you have a strong instinct to maximize opportunity, okay, um, they instinctively know that. And equally, when you do get lucky at a party because you end up with a nice job or you end up invited on holiday or inv end up invited to a better party, you can't really attribute that to any specific party you went to, can you? You just go, well, because I'm a bit out there and I've met a lot of people, some fortunate shit's happened to me, right? But you can't actually necessarily reverse engineer or reverse explain fortune. You, I mean, this happened, by the way, with my book. A very fascinating case in point with my book. And my argument is you should advertise just because when you're famous, okay? If you're a famous company, when your chief executive rings somebody up, they call back, okay? If you're the chief executive of, say, Rolls-Royce or Royal Bank of Canada, okay, you can ring pretty much anybody in the world who isn't a president or prime minister, and they'll call you back, right? If you work for, you know, Zog Incorporated, nobody calls you back, okay? Um, if you're famous, people come and want to work for you. They work for you for less money because they want a famous brand on their CV. People come to you with opportunities. People come to you and propose partnerships. People come to you with good ideas, right? None of which will ever happen if they've never heard of you. Now, the fact is nobody ever says thanks to our marketing campaign, that guy called me back. Therefore, our marketing campaign has been worth eight million pounds because if they hadn't called me back, we wouldn't have got this contract. Okay, but that's how it works. And it's very interesting because I said, look, this is a purely probabilistic justification of indiscriminate mass marketing. And I presented it to Keith Weed, who is the marketing director of Unilever, and he said, you know, the weird thing about that is, he said, I think you're right, he said, but the weirder thing still is, I've worked, you know, I've done my job for 25 years, nobody has ever presented that justification to me. They always say, the purpose of your advertising is to achieve this specific predefined objective. Not, and when I produced my book, by the way, um, the one thing, there's a guy called Chris Evans. Uh, the Brits here will know who he is. He runs a thing called The Virgin Breakfast Show, which has about two million listeners. By complete fluke, one of the press releases from the publisher went to a guy who worked on this show. I never would have sat down and said, it's a behavioral economics book by a marketer about you know, consumer psychology and, you know, and, and, a, and, you know, and a bit of evolutionary psychology. We need to get on The Chris Evans Show. Well, you know, it's a ridiculous objective in advance. But if you make a lot of noise, the odds of some lucky random crap like that happening multiplies by a factor of five or ten. And sure enough, I get invited on the show. He likes the book. I didn't hear this. I was somewhere else. But the next day, he kept burbling on about this book. And the only reason I realized something weird was going on was because for about five days, it was number eight on the Amazon bestsellers chart. So it was actually outselling The Hungry Little Caterpillar. Which, when you think about it, if you've got a child, that's actually compulsory, buying The Hungry Little Caterpillar. It was outselling in the UK the highway code, which you have to buy if you want to learn to drive. Now, there's a really interesting point going on here, which is if we try and make everything quantifiable and we make everything predictable and we make everything measurable, one of the things we're denying ourselves is just the chance to get lucky. And if you think about it, this is very strange, because I've just been on Twitter this afternoon, and there was a very snark, you know, I'm, I'm by the way, 50-50 on Brexit, just in case you ask, OK? <laughs> um, I'm pretty meh about it, to be absolutely honest. Uh, but there are loads of people who go, if we, you know, if we leave the European Union, our GDP will fall by 2.703%, uh, you know, year on year. And if someone else comes in and they said, this is total bollocks. The idea that you can know the future to that level of accuracy um, is ludicrous. If you did, you'd already be a billionaire, if you really could predict that level of accuracy. But the other point I made is that it's a stupid thing anyway, because costs are much easier to quantify than opportunities are. Because costs come out of something we know and can recognize, and opportunities basically come out of the blue, right? So it, 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 one of the reasons I think large corporations are really, really bad at innovating is they're really, really good at working out the costs of things. But when something's unquantifiable, like an opportunity, they immediately run away. Because once there's a degree of uncertainty, even if probabilistically doing something is quite a good idea, once there's a degree of uncertainty, once you can't quantify the benefit, business loses interest completely because you can't put it on a spreadsheet. And so. There's a really, really important point here, which is that we, you know, human behavior is a massively complex system. Um, there are feedback loops, there are interdependencies, there are emergent properties, more or less anywhere.
I mean, one of the strangest things I had as a discussion with Nassim Taleb was the point that one of the reasons capitalism is a really good system is it rewards lucky assholes, right? Now, this, okay, nobody who's rich ever says, I'm lucky, okay? They always write a backstory where their own genius, foresight, and peculiar qualities or determination led to their extraordinary level of wealth. But a very large amount of wealth is, by the way, the product of luck. I mean, if you look at Gates, Jobs, and Ellison, they were all born without about six months of each other. Okay, if you know, not saying that Gates is not a genius, for example, but if he'd been born three years earlier, he would have ended up working for IBM. If he'd been born three years later, he would have ended up working for, Bill, for, for Steve Jobs. Okay, if you wanted to be one of those tech titans, there was a very, very narrow window, geographical and chronological, in which you had to be born. You know, the same person born uh, on the other side of the world wouldn't have stood a chance. Okay. One of the seems interesting points is that, that's, that that is a necessary feature of a really effective market economy. Because you have to reward people who are successful regardless of their reasons for being successful. Because someone who through total luck, or indeed in some cases, by the way, total stupidity. I mean, some business people who are very successful are actually either willfully or accidentally stupid which for a certain percentage of them is a huge advantage because they either don't understand or never grasp the rules of the category and end up doing something randomly different, which one time in a hundred actually proves massively successful because it's in a place where nobody else is trying to be. And Nassim pointed out to me that actually a system which doesn't reward lucky assholes isn't very effective. You have to have a mechanism where if somebody stumbles onto a good idea through total idiocy and good fortune, the good idea is rewarded and allowed to flourish and replicate, regardless of the quality of thinking that actually led to it. Because if you can only reward good ideas that are well thought out, you're probably only rewarding about 10% of the world's good ideas. 90% of the world's good ideas, I mean, okay, you're looking a bit anxious, but I'll put it another way, okay? Should we refuse to use penicillin because it was discovered by luck, okay? That actually a system that basically rewards good fortune is actually essential to the efficient workings of the system. Anyway, I must get on because I've been chatting away. Um, this is one of the problems we have, and this is a Richard Thaler quote, the Nobel Prize winning economist. Uh, the United States government is run by lawyers who occasionally take advice from economists. Others interested in helping the lawyers out need not apply. And I think one of the huge problems we have in uh, the world is that the influence of economists is woefully excessive. Because it's, to be honest, its predictive power is somewhere between like water divining and palmistry. Okay, and yet because economists provide people with unambiguous certainty, uh, however inaccurate it may be, they're incredibly popular in policy making because they can provide a definitive answer to what should be treated as a murky problem. And um, I think the, the, the problem you have to understand is that one of the reasons I really hate economics is because I work in marketing. And if you like psychological solutions, if you believe that value can be created in the head just as much as it can be created in the factory, what you discover when you... Has anybody here studied economics? There must be a few. Okay. What you discover is that in order to produce mathematically neat models of human behavior, um, they assume that everybody makes decisions in an atmosphere of perfect information and perfect trust with stable transitive preferences, okay, that effectively everybody already knows exactly what they want. They know exactly how much utility they'll derive from buying it. They therefore know exactly how much money it's worth spending to buy that thing. And that the value of the thing is unaffected by anything other than what the thing itself is. Okay? Now if you think about it, if that's your weird fantasy world in which your brain, which your brain inhabits, you've created a world in which marketing wouldn't need to exist. There's no role for persuasion, there's no role for branding, there's no role for positioning, there's no role for framing. The only way you can improve something is either making it materially better or dropping the price. Because nothing else would, would improve human well-being. And I think large companies and government are dangerously infected by this belief. That the only way you can improve something is either making the train faster or dropping the price of a ticket. Okay. And my argument would be actually making a train journey more enjoyable probably costs a tiny fraction of either of the other two alternatives. But if you take an economist's view on how to improve the world, that does not show up. 
Also, you would define something very narrowly, by the way, that the purpose of a train is to get you from A to B. To be absolutely honest, in my case, that's not true at all. Uh, if ever I'm invited to give a speaking engagement in Newcastle, uh, my PA goes, why are you going to that? It's an actuaries conference. I go, yeah, I know, but it's a three-hour train journey in both directions. I can actually get some bloody work done, right? Because being on a train now is like being in the office, except people don't interrupt you with dumb questions. <laughs> so you can actually get some stuff done, OK? And so one of the things that's also dangerous is whenever you have a model as an approximation of the world, it gets worse the more it's used. So the more widely it's used and the more repeatedly it's used and the longer and longer it gets used, something happens, which is at first a model tells you things you didn't know. In the end, it ends up convincing you of things you shouldn't believe. And as time goes on, the value from looking at the model and asking, what does this model tell you, I think, falls and falls and falls. And in its place, the value of asking, what's this model wrong about, becomes higher and higher and higher. Because as more and more people effectively rely on the model, the distortions of the model become more important than its accuracies. And I'll give you an example of what is perhaps you know, the perfect cognitive model, something that makes something that's very complicated, mentally accessible, mentally available, and it's the London Tube Map, designed by a guy called Harry Beck. Harry Beck was originally an electrical engineer, so he modelled the, uh, the tube, inverted commas, map, it's actually a schematic diagram, not a map, okay, on wiring diagrams. And in a way, it's very, very good, because you can look at it at a glance. Now, assuming you're trying to get from one tube station to another tube station, probably 90% of the time it does quite a good job. OK? Uh, it's better... No. Now, the interesting thing is, however, uh, it has fairly significant biases, because, one, it's not remotely faithful to distance or geography. Not a bit. Its whole purpose is to be schematically accurate, not to be geographically accurate. This creates, by the way, really weird behavioural distortions. So the red line there, which is the central line, that's grossly overused as a line. Why? Because on the map, it's a straight line. So people look at it and go, that's a straight line going east to west. I want to get from east to west. Therefore, I'll take the red line. OK? The blue line, the light blue line here, is a massive wiggle. Now, the reason for that is simply that it was quite late to be built. And so the tube map already existed, and they had to draw it over a pre-existing tube map. It's actually a pretty straight line. But the way it's depicted on the map is a ludicrous wiggly curve because it has to fit into the existing schematic, OK? Now, it's actually the best tube line. I, I think Joe will agree with me. It's probably the best tube line in London. It's very, very fast, very, very frequent. It's grossly underused because mentally it's not a salient solution to any problem. It looks like the wiggly line. In fact, it's so unsalient that for, for eight years... I didn't realise you could get from Victoria Station to Euston Station on that line. And when I discovered it, it was a complete revelation. Then there are other biases, by the way. The most common um, tourist journey undertaken on the tube map is Leicester Square to Covent Garden, which is one tube stop. It's a distance above ground which you could probably throw a tennis ball if you're reasonably athletic, OK? But people go, oh, it's a tube stop. I better take the tube, OK? Ludicrously close together. Um, when Ogilvy was Lancaster House, uh, there was a woman who used, uh, 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 who used to come into Charing Cross. Uh, I, I can't remember what she did. No, no, that's right. She used to come in on the central line and change to Charing Cross on the northern line every day for a whole year, OK, without realising that the two stations are about 100 yards apart, OK? Um, there are, there are, um, but the vital thing that happens is that there are other distortions, by the way. If you want to get from Paddington to, um, uh, let's say, Bond Street on the red line, OK, this looks as if it's a straight north-south line. Actually, between Paddington and Notting Hill Gate, you're going a long way west in the wrong direction. But the map doesn't show that because it's schematic, OK? Um, the best way to get from Paddington to there is actually to walk to Lancaster Gate, which is Queensway, Lancaster Gate, there. Now, Paddington to Lancaster Gate looks like a massive distance on the map. It's actually a few hundred yards walk, OK? So after a time, what unfortunately happens is people stop even treating the tube map as a tube map. They start treating it as a map of London. And then things go really seriously wrong. <laughs> because, first of all, 
virtually none of the tube is in South London. So North Londoners have no clue how people in South London get to work. I think they think they put their possessions in a white and red spotty handkerchief and tie them to a stick, to be absolutely honest. Um, uh, the rail network of South London, which is huge, extensive, above ground and pretty fast, doesn't appear on the map. Uh, we moved to Blackfriars, which is just here. And loads of my staff, I was asking them, How, you know, how's your journey to work? And they go, oh, it's terrible, really, because I come into St Pancras and um, I have to go all the way around the circle line and then I have to walk across the bridge. I said, what the hell are you talking about? There's a railway line called Thameslink, which goes from St Pancras to within 50 yards of our front door. You go, oh, I didn't know. I go, what the hell are we employing these complete morons for? <laughs> was my first reaction. And then I realised that since my day in the late 80s, Thameslink is no longer on the tube map. It's a really, really good frequent railway line with trains every three minutes. But because London Transport doesn't make any money from Thameslink journeys, they, as a fit of peak, they took it off the map. The whole of the South London rail network isn't on it. And what starts to happen, I tell my staff, OK, my younger staff who can't afford to live in London, I say, it's really, really easy. If you want to find a place where you can afford to live in London, get a tube map and find out what isn't on it. I said, everybody else, all your contemporaries are going, I want to live near to the tube, because that's all they know, OK? I said, go and find a place next to a railway line in South London that's 15 minutes away from the office, and you'll find yourself a bargain. Now, just in case you think this is crazy, two friends of mine moved from Fulham. Now, anybody know Fulham in London? The people who live in Fulham are convinced they live in central London, because it's on the tube. It's basically a suburb of Oxford. I don't know what the hell they think they're thinking, OK? But because it's on the tube, everybody who's on the tube thinks, oh, it's really central, right? They moved to a place called Herne Hill, which isn't on the tube, but is right next to a really good railway uh, network in South London. And because it wasn't on the tube, and because it had Hill in the name, they were basically expecting deliverance, to be absolutely honest, when they moved there, right? <laughs> And to their complete amusement, on their first day at work, after they'd moved, they discovered that their commute took half as long as it did from Fulham. And they genuinely couldn't get their heads around this at all. Because the entire mental idea is that the tube map is what is central and fast and good, and everything that isn't on the tube is basically the work of Beelzebub himself. And so this is what starts to happen with economics. It starts off as a map of a very simplified model of the world, and then eventually people start solving the problem for the model, not solving the problem for reality. And they think that if you've solved the problem on the model, you've solved the problem in real life. And that's what's happened with economics. It's just become grotesquely overused um, to a point where if you suggest anything in business which is economic, consistent with economic theory, nobody really asks you test it, do they? Nobody ever says, well, we, our product, product isn't selling very well, so we'll drop the price. Nobody says, well, you need, you need to test that, because it's consistent with theory. You'll never get fired doing anything that's consistent with theory. Despite the fact that dropping the price of a product you're selling is the worst thing you can possibly do. You're effectively bribing people to buy what you sell. It's the most expensive way of selling a product, almost certainly, is to drop the price. And yet it's the standard default behaviour of business. You should, by the way, before you drop the price of anything that isn't selling, try putting the price up. Now, that's going to drive you crazy, isn't it? I did this with KFC in South Africa, um, and they had a product that wasn't selling. And I said, have you tried putting the price up? And they go, well, how is that going to work? I said, well, it probably won't work, but if it does work, it's a hell of a lot more valuable than discovering that putting the price down works, right? And they tried it, and weirdly, demand went up a lot. Now, I think there's a reason for that, by the way. Very simple, if you think about it. How many people here are KFC fans? No one. No one. Oh, oh, is, oh, is that a Canadian local alternative? I'm sorry. OK. <laughs> the point is, I think you go for KFC for two reasons. I think you go for a bargain or you go for a treat. And if something's priced in the middle, it's neither a bargain nor a treat. So this is what I mean about sometimes the opposite of a good idea is a good idea. I went bedding shopping with my wife once. And after I'd been looking at various bits of bedding for about 25 minutes, I said, can I make a deal with you? And she said, what's that? I said... Can we spend one of two amounts of money in the shop, please? Nothing or a lot. And I said, what the hell do you mean? Why, why would you want to do that? I said, well, I'm not that bothered about our existing bedding. It doesn't, like, hurt me or pain me in any way. It's, I'm fine with it, right? OK. Uh, so if we spend nothing, I can go home and I'm perfectly happy with this existing bedding. I've saved 200 quid and maybe I can go and buy a drone or something, right? OK, I don't mind spending nothing because the bedding's OK. I said, 
What I don't want to spend is £200, so I've spent £200 and the bedding's no better than our existing bedding. What's the point of that? I said. On the other hand, I said, being a bit of a nerdy bloke, if we spend £500, I can get nerdily excited by things like thread counts, <laughs> Egyptian cotton. Actually, I'm in Canada now. You, you, you're really into tog values, aren't you, and stuff like that, are you? OK? I can get you know, really excited about down, right? I can get really excited about feathers, you know, Oxford pillowcases, all that stuff. Uh, maybe even, wait for it, a mattress topper. <laughs> uh, OK? Now, that, I spent 500 quid, but at least I've got an endorphin rush, right? OK? Whereas if we spend 200 quid, I'm 200 quid poorer, and I've got no endorphin rush. I always say that, by the way. That's the problem with mid-market retail, isn't it? You don't get an endorphin rush from mid-market retail. You get a thrill at TK Maxx, and you get a thrill buying something that's more expensive than you should. But if you buy something in the middle, it's kind of meh, OK? So quite a lot of these things are kind of weird. You know, the, as I said, you can't go around assuming economics is true because Life's just more complicated than that. There are weird things there. It's worth remembering that most of human life is emergent, OK? It hasn't been designed, and therefore things don't necessarily serve an absolutely clear purpose. There's a great concept in conservatism called the Chesterton's Fence from G.K. Chesterton, who made the point that there's a very strong human urge where if you're walking around and you see something that doesn't make sense, there's a fence there, and you don't understand what the fence is for, you knock it down. And Chesterton said that's the opposite of what you should do. You should first of all find out why someone built the fence, and then, if you're convinced then that that reason is no longer valid, knock the fence down. But don't knock something down simply because it doesn't appear to make sense, because it may have an evolutionary purpose within the system that you don't understand. And the classic example of this is actually, it's a good example in Canada, is the monarchy, OK? It's a bit like the human appendix. It's totally useless most of the time, but occasionally it serves a useful purpose. Uh, there's a great definition, of, by the way, the value of having a monarchy, which is it's like the, the king in chess, which is its value lies not in what it does, but in the squares it denies to the other pieces. And the best reason to have a monarchy is you don't want your prime minister living in a palace. Have you seen what happens in France, right? They get the president, they put him in a palace, three years later they all go bonkers, right? Okay, it's a really bad idea having large amounts of national bling attached to elected officials. It's much better having someone totally arbitrary doing that stuff because it takes it out of the realm of politics. Also, if you think about it, the very fact that they're a totally gratuitous individual who exists purely through fluke is exactly the strength of the system. In the United States, every time you have an election now, 48% of the population feel they've lost their country, OK? If you've got a monarchy, however arbitrary and stupid and ridiculous it is, and however tokenistic it is, you don't feel the same thing. So just because something looks a bit stupid, OK, doesn't mean that you, your, your instinct to get rid of it is necessarily healthy. There are things which look pointless and which in the short term you can probably remove with impunity, Actually, the human appendix, interestingly, they, they, having long believed it was entirely pointless, it's nothing of the kind. It's because when you have a bad bout of the shits, your appendix effectively keeps a sample of your gut bacteria, which can repopulate your gut once you get a bit better. OK? So it, it's a bit like those you know, miners used to carry sourdough, um, a live culture around their neck in a little pouch. OK? It, you know, it's a living thing that preserves a particular sort of uh, gut um, microflora balance, uh, even when you have very bad... And, and under certain uh, hospital illnesses, you're much better off having an appendix, actually. Um, most of the time, though, it's useless. Um, if you look at you know, the monarchy in Spain, OK, it was uh, decisive at one point. When Franco died, he wanted the power to pass the monarch without the monarch saying, no, this is going to be a democracy, you wouldn't have achieved it. OK? The very fact that the person's arbitrary... The Catalans, I think, are making a big mistake. They want a Catalan republic. Okay? To be honest, if you're prepared to just retain the monarchy, you could have a huge degree of autonomy without it seeming like a major identity crisis for the Spanish, because you've kept some symbolic link at the very top. So I, I've always wanted to ask... There aren't any Catalans here, are there? I've always wanted to ask why they're so insistent on the Republic idea, because it seems to make the whole thing more difficult than it would be otherwise. Um, 
And so what we've done with economics is we've created this McNamara fallacy anyway, where everything has to make sense, everything has to be measurable, everything has to be quantifiable. And that's based on the assumption that life is like physics, where all the important metrics that determine the outcome of something are numerically available and uh, that you have all the information required to understand the condition and it can all be expressed in one or two or three units and their interrelation. And as Hayek discovered in his Nobel Prize acceptance speech, if you think about human behaviour, OK, there are hugely important things in human behaviour which don't have a unit. They don't have a mathematical expression. There isn't an SI unit of irritation or annoyance or regret or, you know, disdain or insult. Any of those things which might drive our behaviour, OK, they aren't mathematically expressible. So the idea that you can create this totally stupid mathematical model of human behaviour um, uh, as though humans were like atoms is basically absurd. And it's known sometimes as the, as the quantitative fallacy. It's sometimes actually called the McNamara fallacy because during the Vietnam War, this guy who came from industry wanted to fight the Vietnam War quantitatively. And he was obsessed with having a numerical metric and rather tragically, the metric he decided on was the kill count. And it was the kill ratio. Now, that was bad in two ways. It's bad because it's a horrible metric to have in the first place and a horrible objective. It was also bad because if you're fighting a guerrilla war, if you kill someone unjustifiably, you probably create three volunteers for every one person you kill. So in many ways, it was actually a... It was actually a diametrically wrong metric to choose. But there wasn't a metric for hearts and minds. There wasn't a metric for winning over emotional support. So you're forced to basically pick whatever happens to be numerically available, which may be an appalling thing to choose. And so I often describe, when I said that the tube map, after a time it's more interesting knowing what it's wrong about uh, than what it's right about. Uh, I'd often say that there's a science of knowing what economics and logic is wrong about. Because if we overuse logic and we overuse economics, at some point there's a lot of value to be determined in saying, if everybody else thinks this, where does this cause problems? I've also argued that in business it's different from science. In science you're trying to be right. But in business you don't actually have to be right, you just have to be less wrong than your competition. OK. And so I'll just give a few examples. One of the interesting things that fascinates me is that if you look at a business, it's only the marketers within the business who are really looking at what does this business seem like when viewed through a customer's eyes over time. If you don't have, if you're trying to change human behaviour, or you're trying to change the world, or you're trying to build a, uh, build a popular business, or you're trying to grow a business, and you don't spend some time looking at something through the consumer's eyes, you can basically do really, really dumb things. And this happened to me. This, came, this actually happened to me about a month ago. Okay? So a bunch of economists and completely rational people decided that to encourage people to get electric cars in the UK, they'd subsidise electric cars to the tune of about £5,000. And they also decided that um, uh, to encourage people to get electric cars, it would help if there was a subsidy if you got one of those seven kilowatt charging posts at home. So instead of costing £500 to install it, you'd only have to pay 250 So I think, oh, this is looking pretty good. So I go to my electric car dealership and say, I'd like to buy an electric car. And they go, look, here's one here. You get a subsidy. I go, great, yeah. OK, but before I buy that car, I'd better go home and make sure I can get one of those electric charging points because I don't want to spend the next three years with a bloody cable coming out of my bathroom window. So I ring up the charging point people, and they go, yeah, you get a subsidy. I said, I know, I heard about this already, £250. They go, yeah. So instead of costing £500, you can install a 7-kilowatt fast charger for only 250 I said, sign me up, I'm right there. They said, you've got to prove you've got an electric car. Now, no one in the Department of Transport has read Catch-22, <laughs> OK? But the other weird thing when you think about it is this. I said, as a marketer, you don't actually need to subsidise the electric car. Because if you can persuade someone to spend £200 getting a charging point installed on their house, the next car they buy is bound to be electric, isn't it? Because imagine this, OK? You've just spent £250. You've got this nice 7 kilowatt charger on the wall of your house. Well, you're going to feel a bit of a dickhead buying a diesel, aren't you? Really? <laughs> OK? 
So I said, look, a marketer would say the most important thing is to get people to install a charging point. Have a subsidy which reduces over time so everybody has a real hurry to install their charging points. Once everybody's got a charging point at home, selling the buggers a car is actually a piece of cake. But no one outside the marketing viewpoint understands path dependency or order effects. Because they just go, we've subsidized the car, we've subsidized the charging point, therefore we've solved the problem. Um, if you want to solve problems psychologically, we have in the NHS a lot of debate uh, back home about waiting times. And of course, waiting times are measured objectively. How long did the person have to wait before they saw the specialist who could treat their condition? Now, my cousin, who's a consultant in A&E in the north of England, points out that actually, how people emotionally react to waiting to see a doctor in accident and emergency in a hospital can be completely transformed by a tiny little bit of alchemy. It's a tiny little trick. When the person comes in with whatever their condition is, you see them quite quickly. There's a triage nurse, something similar, who goes, OK, you'll need to see the specialist in so-and-so, and it may take a few hours. Now here's the decisive moment. If you say, come and wait for the specialist, and you show them into a different waiting room, they're completely happy sitting there for three hours. If you send them back to the original waiting room, they go batshit insane after about 35 minutes. <laughs> the my argument is, look, why do we have as a metric time when actually the metric we're trying to reduce is irritation? And it's again, it's the McNamara fallacy. We're trying to have a metric which is objective when the only thing that really matters isn't how long someone has to wait, it's how bloody irritating the wait is. And so this obsession with being objective prevents us from deploying really useful, cheap, and easy psychological solutions. By the way, funnily enough, I sort of knew about this because um, KPMG, the consultancy firm in London, uh, you go into their reception, and if they're expecting you, they show you through into a completely different reception, which has an espresso machine, a load of comfy chairs and magazines. And the weird thing was, you know, I had to, for some reason, they were running really late. I had to wait half an hour. Now, had I been left in the downstairs reception, I would have been really pissed off after 20 minutes. To be honest, once they'd taken me through to the slightly nicer room, I was happy as Larry for the next 45, OK? I don't know why it works either. It's weird, but who cares? It works, right? We don't have to understand it to use it. Uh, your own Canadian chappy, I believe, is the co-inventor of Uber, is that right? Apparently, one day, one afternoon, he was watching Goldfinger Anybody know this? That the whole inspiration for Uber came from the film Goldfinger, where Bond is following Auric Goldfinger through the Swiss Alps, and his Aston Martin has a tracking device in the dashboard with a dot on a, on a scrolling map. And your fellow Canadian was watching this one afternoon, possibly under the influence of some substance or other, <laughs> and said, that's what should happen when you order a taxi. Uber is an extraordinarily clever piece of ingenious psychology in that it doesn't reduce the time you wait for a cab so much as massively reduce the frustration you feel ordering one. And there are about seven tricks I could list. If I'm going into the whole burble thing, I can point seven really ingenious things it does which you may not even notice. The first one, which no one notices, is by giving you an estimate of wait time before you commit, it manages your expectation. So if it says, oh, estimated waiting time is 17 minutes, you go, oh, shit, that's a bit long. And then you go book, and the car says, I'll be there in 13. You don't go, oh, Christ, it's 13 minutes. You go, oh, it's faster than I expected, OK? Because a huge amount of human happiness is nothing to do with reality. It's to do with comparison with expectation, OK? Um, the coolest hotel I think I've ever stayed in, it was an Amnesty International conference. And if you're Amnesty, you know who Amnesty International is, you know, campaigning against injustice and stuff, you know, all very Canadian. And um, uh, obviously if you're Amnesty International, you can't just take over like a blinged up five-star hotel. So they had this conference in a former, my goodness, in a former um, police station in East Berlin. And the rooms were cells, okay? Uh, and... I, I promise I'm not making this up, OK? Your, the rooms were so small that your bed was actually on a platform above your shower. Uh, the walls were concrete. There was a basic sort of rug on the floor. There might have been a small wall hanging on the concrete wall, you know, a bit like an ISIS video, you know, <laughs> right? There was a black and white TV in your room. It only had one channel, and the channel, I'm not making this up, to this day, only ever shows one thing, which is the Big Lebowski in continuous loop. <laughs> okay. 
Now, the interesting thing about this was if you turned up at this hotel, they did one very clever thing. They had a brilliant 24-hour hipster coffee shop in the middle of the hotel, which served pretty much the best coffee I've ever had in my life, OK? Very clever thing. If you're going to do everything in a minimalist way, you've got to do one thing brilliantly well as a kind of, look, when, you know, this isn't all misery. Um, but the, when I thought about this, I thought what was amazing about this is if you turned up expecting the Marriott, it would have been the worst evening of your life, basically, if you'd expected a conventional hotel. If you were told this is an East Berlin hipster hotel in a former police station, it was absolutely bang on the money. Whether something's good or bad is, to some extent, expectation plus or minus reality. It's not actually a function of what it is. It's a function of what you were promised and what you get. Which is why it's sometimes a really good idea to gratuitously add something that people weren't expecting. Uh, those, I don't know if you're fans of Five Guys. Uh, I, I know it's not Tim Hortons. I know, I, I, uh, do you know I'm actually followed by Tim Hortons on Twitter? Which I'm told is basically pathway to citizenship, uh, pretty much. <laughs> OK. But um, Five Guys, if you notice, when they give you fries, they fill the cup small, medium, or large, and then they actually give you a whole scoop of extra fries in the bottom of the bag. That's a brilliant thing which says, this isn't just transactional capitalism, this is relational capitalism. We're giving you a little bit extra that you weren't expecting. Anybody who stayed at a, a, a Doubletree hotel with those cookies? Uh, anybody done this? They have an oven underneath the check-in desk. Now, I'm a Brit, bear in mind, and so I turn up and they go, to welcome you to the Doubletree Chicago, here is a bag of our signature Doubletree. And as a Brit, I go, oh, for fuck's sake, you know, what's this crap about? But actually, the weird thing is, they're actually hot from an oven, and you take them up to the room, and they're actually delicious. Now, apparently, I talked to someone who worked at the Doubletree, the finance director's been trying to kill the cookies for the last 10 years as an unnecessary cost. But the point is, I haven't stayed in a double tree for 15 years. It's the, la it's the only thing I remember. And if my PA ever came to me and said, do you want to stay at the Hilton Courtyard Garden, or whatever it is, or do you want to stay at the double tree? 15 years later, I go, cookies, double tree. OK? <laughs> Apparently, the marketing director, by the way, is so pissed off with the finance director that last time he tried to kill the cookies, she just made them 50% bigger to piss him off. <laughs> But that's the point. It's gratuitous, but the very fact that it's gratuitous, unexpected, and unpromised is kind of what makes it special. You know, if you think about manners, all human politeness consists of slightly unnecessary effort. You know, it's slightly gratuitous effort, which shows you're actually going out of your way for someone rather than treating them in a kind of, uh, you know, transactional, one-off way. And so, um, very interestingly, my point is, there are loads of problems which, if you just reframe them psychologically, you can solve them really, really cheaply. Um, the problem is that no one even tries, because we give the problems to economists and engineers, and the only way they know how to solve a problem is by changing the objective reality. They haven't got any conception of using a bit of alchemy or a few mind tricks. And so this is this weird thing we have in the UK. 60 billion pounds, it's going to take 10, 15, 20 years to build a high-speed rail link uh, between London and Manchester, which will be about an hour and five minutes, instead of two hours and ten. <coughs> now, I won't go into the whole verbal stuff about it, but I merely pointed out to these people that the two purposes of this new railway line, costing £60 billion and taking 10, 15, 20 years to build, was to reduce journey time between London and Manchester and to increase the capacity of the network. Okay? And I made the simple point that if they wanted to do that, I could do that for them for £2.5 million and it would cost about, it'd take about six months. And they said, that's absolute rubbish. You can't do that. I said, yes, I can. I said, I'll just redefine what reducing journey time means. Every time I travel to Manchester, I buy a thing called an advanced ticket. It's a bit like low-cost airlines, OK? That means you can only travel on a specified train. But if you don't buy an advanced ticket, it costs about a million pounds. So you buy an advanced ticket, OK? And then you're frightened of missing that train, so you turn up at Euston Station to take your train to Manchester about 45 minutes early to leave a safe margin of error in case you miss the train. During that time, two trains leave, half empty, 40 minutes and 20 minutes before the one you're allowed to travel on. So all you need is to have an app that says pay five pounds and you can join the earlier train and you can sit in seat J8, right? What you've done there by allowing people to pay to take an earlier empty train is you've reduced their journey time by 40 minutes or 20 minutes, because train, three trains an hour leave from Manchester, OK? And um, you've increased the capacity of the network, because allowing people to travel on em earlier empty seats 
is a good yield management practice. I don't want to get into the whole nerdiness of this, but if you think about it, if you want to get as many people from one place to another, okay, you let you try and fill the train with each iteration. When you saw the Americans leaving the Saigon embassy, okay, they didn't say, no, you're booked on the helicopter in 20 minutes, did they? They said, get as many people on as we can, okay? They didn't, you know. Now, in the same way, if you want to maximize the capacity of a train network, you let people get on as, as soon as they turn up because then that frees later seats for someone else who turns up later. Now, I'm not saying my solution would save as much time or indeed increase capacity to the same extent as spending 60 billion pounds, but why would you spend 60 billion pounds before you've even bothered to implement my suggestion? <laughs> I just ask. The second thing is my suggestion reduces the totally wasted part of the journey, which is hanging around at the station waiting for your train to leave. Their 60 billion solution reduces the duration of the best part of the journey, which is the time you're sitting on the train, which is actually quite useful. And when I say there's a kind of blind spot where people are incapable of spotting psychological solutions to problems and resort to kind of economic or engineering solutions before they've even asked the question of what do people actually care about. When you think about it, we design chairs to fit the human body, OK? But well, we should design experiences to fit the human brain. We shouldn't ask the question, is this experience long or short? We should ask, what sort of duration does the human brain like? There's some evidence, by the way, which I, I was talking about this very subject. And an econ funny enough, an economist came to me and said, there's quite a lot of evidence, I don't know if anybody else believes me, um, that people actually prefer not to live that close to work. Does anybody else find that believable? That actually there's an optimal distance. People like to have a kind of mental bridge between when I'm at work and when I'm at home. And living next door to the office is actually something people, deep down, when you look at actual behavior, people don't want to do it. So actually you can have a commute which is too short, which seems completely weird. But as I said, the, in psychology, in, in physics, the opposite of right is wrong. But actually in, in psychology, the opposite of right can be another good idea. This is why it's, it, it's so strange. It's completely nonlinear. And the other vital thing to understand is that whether something's good or bad, what economics has done is it's created this idea that um, all marketing does is add a little bit of magic fairy dust, tiny little bit of added value. My contention is, no, no, you can have the most brilliant product in the world if you don't market it well, if you don't present it to people in a way they can understand, in a way that conveys conviction, plausibility, trustworthiness, OK? It doesn't matter how good your product is. Economics assumes trust. It assumes perfect knowledge, OK? In reality, if you haven't sorted out the trust and you haven't sorted out the marketing, you can have the best product in the world and no one will buy it. And I wanted to prove that with an experiment which took a really good product and marketed it really badly. And obviously, no one would, no one would agree to do that, OK? But then I found two Australian comedians had actually weirdly done the experiment for me. Does this... Yeah. Hello. Hi. Whee! Heap shows. They have a pretty bad name. Normally associated with lewd content, but by definition, they don't have to be. So in an attempt to change that, we took one of the world's biggest performing artists, kept all his clothes on, and set up an Ed Sheeran heap show. Would anyone dare to believe what was written outside and come in to our very dodgy looking venue? How uh, are you feeling? <laughs> that was fair enough, because we dressed Hamish as a fairly shady looking spruker in charge of getting customers. I got you shearing. Who wants some shearing? Oh, I can hear Hamish. I share anyone? I don't think we'll get anyone. It's going to be a brave soul. I wouldn't I wouldn't come into If there was a dude with a beard and a hat and say, I'd come in and see this. Ed was right. This was going to be tough. You want to pay for Ed Sheeran for two bucks? Insurance. Do you want to peep at Ed Sheeran? <laughs> Your loss. What do you reckon, big fella? Got Ed Sheeran in here. Beautiful Gigi head man. Sitting on a stool. What do you reckon? Two bucks. Got Ed Sheeran just sitting on a stool in there. You want him? Two bucks. Two bucks for a peep. Think about it. It's actually pretty good value. Despite trying, we had a total lack of interest for over 50 minutes. It's been some time. <laughs> we should have got you a more comfy chair, I think. Yeah, I'm all right. Sheeran, you need in there two bucks. All the Ed Sheeran you need. All the what? Ed Sheeran. Oh, I don't know what that is. He's a singer. <laughs> yeah? Is that he is? No? I think one of the big problems is people think Ed Sheeran's a code word for
What, like, are they just saying, like, yeah, that's a good Dirt cheap, Pete. Dirt cheap, Pete. Here we go, two bucks. Do you reckon we're pricing it too high, and that's why we're not getting people coming in? I think two dollars is pretty fat. <laughs> Someone actually does think it's a peep show. I'm gonna quickly give you the go ahead to take before you close. You're willing to do that? Uh, been drinking a lot of beer recently. Oh right. <laughs> yeah. You're not. A couple of months ago maybe, but yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, uh, I'm in shape. It's just the shape of the potato. <laughs> Two hours in. And Hamish was getting more desperate. And Sherry's literally sitting in there on the stage waiting for your $2. We were feeling it as well. But just when we thought this had been a giant waste of everyone's time. You guys like it, Sherry? I love it. You love it, Sherry? Two bucks. Heap show. Just got him sitting on stage in there. Well, two bucks. It's going to cost you two bucks. You only get 30 seconds, though. You okay, then? What? I believe you. Well, I was the only one way to find out. We might be on here. Here we go, Ed Sheeran Peep Show. He's here till midday. No, All right, no. your choice. No, she did the smart thing and walked away. <laughs> Listen, if you, guys, if you guys want to, I'm just saying, if you guys want to have a go, sit me in there by himself, it'll probably get busy later on. Two bucks, 30 seconds. I mean, you both can come if you want. Just two bucks ahead. Everything's above board, I can assure you. I'm going to get uh, nah, absolutely not. I can't guarantee what it'll do, but uh, yeah, pay you two bucks. And after two hours and 23 minutes, including some final hesitation, we finally found people brave enough to take a peek. Did you guys go to peep shows a lot or? No, oh, I'm yeah. okay. <laughs> There you go, man. Keep your clothes on, stay on the seat, behave yourselves. Just listen to the announcement, have a good one. Enjoy your peep. Hello, welcome to the peep show. Your time will start in five seconds. But the interesting thing about that is that um, if you think about it, if you'd actually just put a single half, well, let's say a half page ad in the Melbourne Age, I think it's called, isn't it? The old Melbourne newspaper. Okay, half page on the Melbourne Age, you could have charged $200 for that and you would have had a queue going around the block. Okay. People actually expect something to be advertised with an expense commensurate with the significance of the product. And actually, if you undermarket a good product, it doesn't make sense to people. Because they think, well, if this is really as good as you say it is, you'd be making more noise about it than you are. And if you think about it, flowers understand marketing, because a flower is basically a weed with an advertising budget, OK? And what they understand is that bees know that it's costly for flowers to produce petals. It makes you very obvious to herbivorous animals, OK? It takes quite a lot of resources to produce the color and the size of these petals. Therefore, the only reason you'd go to this effort of displaying your wares is because you've probably got a reliable source of nectar there. Because if there wasn't any nectar, then bees would only visit you once, and it's not worth spending all that money to get one visit. And so it's a reliable signal because it's costly. It's like betting on your own horse. Everybody says their own horse is going to win if there's a horse race. If you actually visibly bet on your own horse with your own money, now that's information that any gambler will use because they know you genuinely believe it because you're putting money behind what you claim. And in the same way, really good ideas that aren't marketed enough just don't seem like good ideas to humans. Now, you could argue that's an inefficiency, and maybe it is from a pure economic standpoint, but in a world where you need to convince someone of the value of something before they can confidently act, that's a necessity. You have no choice but to spend some money promoting something in order for people to believe that what you have is as significant as you claim it is. And so, Looking at that business, it's only when you understand the world through someone else's eyes, it's only when you understand the world through a bee's eyes that you understand flowers.
Okay? It's only when you understand the world through the eyes of a human being that you really understand what's going on. And typically, what economics does is it doesn't look at the world as experienced by an individual over time. It looks at aggregates, it looks at averages, it looks at information added up. Now, one of the most crazy distortions in the whole media landscape over the last 50 years, uh, true, as true in Canada as it is in the UK, is rising property prices were, for about 40 years, portrayed as a good news story, weren't they? Good news, house prices have gone up. Okay? Now, it's true that when house prices go up, aggregate wealth increases. On the other hand, if you look at it through the eyes of an individual, for 90% of your adult life, you want property prices to stay the same or even go down a bit. Why? Because if you're buying a first home, a property price rise means it's now more expensive. If you're moving from a smaller home to a bigger home, the gap between the old house and the new house is getting bigger when property prices go up. The only people for whom property price rises are a good, a good news are people planning to downsize at the end of their life or people planning to kill their parents. Okay. <laughs> So for 80% of, of the population at any one time, you actually want stable property prices. But in the economic world, rising property prices are good news because you're not looking at the human experience, you're looking at the aggregate. And this is actually a really interesting thing in mathematics. Can I get a bit nerdy just for a second? I learned this from the, this guy, Ole, Phillips, who, uh, Ole Peters, who's a, um, a mathematician at the London Mathematical Laboratory. Um, he published a paper with Murray Gelman, who's a Nobel Prize winning physicist, with the claim that economics has been completely wrong in its idea of human decision making and behavior for the last hundred years. And the reason that economics has been completely wrong is it assumes that utility is additive. It's something you add, not something you multiply. Now, if you look at human fortune, there's something multiplicative about human fortune. The one thing you don't want in your life is three bad events in quick succession. That's much worse than three bad events that are spaced out. Okay? Now, this is the mathematical demonstration of how what happens to the world on average isn't the same as what individuals experience. Right? So if you're trying to improve something like GDP, which is an average measure, that actually has no bearing, really, on the individual experience of any given individual as they live their life over time. In fact, you can have a world where everybody's getting richer and where GDP is going down. I mean, I know that sounds weird, but I, I promise you that's true. Okay? You can have a world where GDP is going up, everybody's getting poorer. And... This is an interesting bet, okay? Imagine you have this bet where everybody starts with £100 uh, and there's a guy standing next to them who repeatedly tosses a coin. And the deal is, every time that heads comes up, you get 50% richer. Every time that tails comes up, you get 40% poorer. Now, most of you will go, that sounds like a pretty good bet to me. Half the time I get 50% richer, the other half of the time I only get 40% poorer. So on average, I'm going to be 5% richer every time the coin's tossed. OK? And that is sort of true, except the word average is meaningless when applied to an individual. Because you don't enjoy the average gains, you only enjoy what happens to you. So let's just show an example of this. It kind of fascinates me, this. OK? So everybody tosses the coin once, two of them get heads, two of them get tails. Two of them have 150 quid, they're better off. Two of them are 40 pounds worse off, OK? But it's 50-50. And actually, the total wealth has gone up from £400 to £420. That's a 5% gain. So you think, that's a great bet. Keep tossing that coin. I'm off to Barbados with the winnings. Except let's look what happens when you toss the coin just twice. OK? One guy ends up with a stack of money. He's got £225. The remaining three are worse off than when they started. OK? Two of them have now got £90. Um, which means, effectively, they're worse off than the 100 they started with. The fourth guy is seriously skint. This guy now has to throw three heads in a row just to get back his original stake. Now, I know this is a very nerdy mathematical distinction, but the fact that what we experience over time is fundamentally different to um, the ensemble average outcome of 10 people's outcome all added together and averaged is apparently where economics went wrong. And uh, it causes economics to obsess about the collective outcome 
like overall people are getting richer because property prices are going up, rather than the time series outcome, which is, oh shit, every time I'm trying to move, get an extra bedroom, it's costing me more and more money, which is by far the more common human experience over time in a lived life. And what it means is, I think, sorry, okay, you know, absolutely. What this is called is ergodicity, and uh, it's, something is only ergodic if the average ensemble outcome is the same as the time series outcome, okay? In real life, it's very rare that things are. Um, what this explains is a hell of a lot about human decision-making, because we're not trying to optimise, in many ways, we're trying to reduce variance. Because under... Oh, this is getting a bit nerdy, I apologise for this. Under multiplicative <laughs> dynamics, OK, <laughs> low variance is better than high variance. In additive dynamics, there's no difference between 2 plus 2 plus 2 plus 2 and 3 times 1 times 3... Uh, sorry, 3 plus 1 plus 3 plus 1. Under multiplicative dynamics, 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 is a much bigger number... What is that? 64 is a much bigger number than 27 which is 3 times 1 times 3 times 1 times 3 times 1, OK? And they argue that a very large part of human instinct, if this mathematical model of theirs is right and the economist model is wrong, a large part of human instinct is towards doing something which means that we'd much prefer that something that's between OK and pretty good than something that could be brilliant or might be terrible. OK? And so a large part of our instinct is to avoid any potentially catastrophic outcome. Now, I would argue, and, I, and Ole actually kind of agrees with me, fascinatingly, this explains why McDonald's is the most popular restaurant in the world. It's not because it's really, really good. It's because it's really good at not being terrible. Um, anybody know what Hussein Bolt eats for the two weeks before he competes in the Olympics? Chicken McNuggets, yeah. Now, you're going to go, what? this man's body is a temple, OK? Hussein Bolt's argument is very simple and completely correct, OK? I am basically the best runner in the world. Therefore, if nothing cocks up, I will win. There are only two things I need not to cock up. One, lots of protein. Two, I don't get ill. Now, say what you like about the golden arches, but I've had the shits eating at Michelin-starred restaurants much more often than I have eating at McDonald's, OK? The actual downside risk of a Michelin-starred restaurant is quite high, right? The biggest Ebola... Well, not Ebola, sorry. The, <laughs> the biggest E. coli outbreak in, in Britain that ever happened happened at a Michelin three-star restaurant, which was the fat duck in Bray, OK? And actually... A large part of human instinct is going, you know, actually the difference between good and great is nice, it's interesting. Now, don't get me wrong, if, if you're trying to show off, you know, if you're dating someone, you don't take them to McDonald's, OK? That's what Nando's is for, after all, OK? <laughs> but um, but if, you're, if you're Hussein Bolt and your basic thing is, I don't want to get it, I get cross because Heathrow Terminal 5's now got so poncy, there isn't a McDonald's there. And my argument is, this annoys me because I'm about to spend 10 hours in a pressurised metal container at 35,000 feet. I'm not really that interested in having a great meal. I just don't want to get ill. And yet what they have at Heathrow is a sodding oyster bar, OK? If there's one thing you don't want, it's food poisoning at 35,000 feet, right? Now, I would also argue, taking this further, that's why humans copy each other. Because if you copy each other, it may not be optimal, but it won't be catastrophic. Because what everybody does is somewhere between OK and pretty good. But it's very rarely terrible, OK? It's also why we maintain habits. Because if you do the same thing as you've done before, there's less chance of significant downside risk than if you try something new. OK? I'd also argue that's why we pay a premium for brands. Because brands, and this was an extraordinary sentence, which happened in a uh, discussion, happened in Chicago in about 1955, 1960, between David Ogilvy and Joel Raffleson, where Joel Raffleson said to David, I don't think people buy brand A over brand B because they think it's better. I think they buy it because they're more certain that it's good. And I would argue that brand preference is a heuristic humans deploy to buy something which they... No brand can guarantee that it's always going to be the best thing, OK? Samsung are not clever enough to say, we will always have the best television for $1,500. Nobody's that good. The reason we buy a brand is whether in terms of you know, social or reputation risk or in terms of reliability, if you buy a branded TV, OK, it will be somewhere between pretty good and very good. 
If you buy a TV you've never heard of, it might be a bit of a bargain, but the risk that it's significantly awful is much, much higher. And we basically see brands as a reliable indicator of non-crapness. And therefore, fascinatingly for advertising people, buying them isn't irrational. And I'll end on this very quickly, because I've got to do the Q&A. But I'm just going to talk very quickly through one more subject, if that's OK. Now, one of the reasons why what I think is so important about psychological solutions needs to be considered is not only because economics is wrong, and we need to understand where economics is driving us astray, because I genuinely think the obsession with quantitative uh, metrics, uh, the obsession with um, uh, what economists think of as objectively important uh, measures of success, uh, is an extraordinarily wasteful focus of attention compared to actually creating a life that people genuinely enjoy. Okay? Designing life around human perception and human happiness seems to be more important than trying to always improve metrics like speed, time, duration, cost. Uh, that's the first point. The second point I make is that so much that's important now in life, if we want to change behavior, has got nothing to do with economics at all. So this is my wash basin, okay? It broke six months ago. The reason I haven't repaired the wash basin is not economic. Okay, if I could wave a contactless credit card over the wash basin, pay £300 and have it instantly repair itself, I would have done that within five seconds of the accident occurring, okay? The reason I haven't done it is basically because the pain in the arse business of finding a day when you're free, when there's a plumber available, agreeing with your wife which taps to get on the new wash basin, deciding which colour the wash basin has to be, basically getting all those things decided at once is almost impossible. So the reason I failed to do this is not because I don't want to do it or that it's too expensive to do. It's because the choice architecture, but which I have to undergo in order to solve the problem, is too convoluted and too complex. Now, why is my wash basin so important? Because I'd argue the same applies also to uh, environmentalism. I think passionate environmentalists have tried everything and very passionately, what they really want people to do is to give up everything simultaneously. It's never going to happen. If you presented people, I don't think people have a lack of will in terms of changing their lives to present far less of a deleterious uh, carbon footprint on the planet. I don't think there's a lack of will in the developed world at all. I don't think there's really a lack of belief for the most part. What there hasn't been is no one has been presented with a clear decision path that gets them from where we are here to where we need to be in a way that individuals can sensibly adopt. Now, what I would like to see happen here, now, let me explain what would solve my wash basin problem first, okay? Does anybody work for TaskRabbit or anybody use one of those online services where you get home handymen? It suddenly occurred to me about six weeks ago that they get it wrong. They ask, what do you need done? Now, I know what I need done. I need a plumber to replace my wash basin. No. If you change the order of the questioning, where you said, when's the next day you're going to be at home all day? And I work from home on Fridays, I go a week on Friday, I'm going to be at home all day. And then they could say, a week on Friday, you're at home all day, during that time we can supply you with a plumber, a carpenter, a guy who'll put up flat screen TVs, a bloke who'll replace wash basins. I might get three of them done, okay? They're doing it the wrong way around. They're saying, what do you need done? Well, that's not helping my problem. I know that already, OK? If they could say, the next day you're going to be at home all day, here are the people we can provide, now you've actually solved the coordination problem. If the United Nations basically went to the developed world and said, here are 10 behaviors that really make a difference, adopt veganism for six months of the year, refuse to fly for eight months of the year, OK? Don't own a car, install solar panels, right? Add a few more if you want to. You know, for example, uh, what, what other things could you do? Uh, yeah, don't own a car. Um, always travel by train uh, for any journey under four hours or six hours or whatever, okay? I don't think you'd have any trouble getting everybody to pledge to adopt three of them. Now, the interesting thing about human behavior is once you've got a significant number of people adopting all these behaviors, it becomes easier for everyone to adopt them. You only need about 20% of people to be vegan for every restaurant to have to offer a vegan option. Now, if you notice, I notice this in Canada, when every restaurant has two vegan op options and two vegetarian ones, the ratio of meat dishes to vegetarian dishes now means that loads of people who would perhaps eat meat quite often end up with a vegetarian meal. 
Now, by contrast, I remember having friends, my daughter's vegetarian, 25 years ago in the UK, being vegetarian and going to a restaurant basically meant you had one choice. You know, the rather sad looking thing that was cheaper and didn't taste very good, okay? Once people say, I can't fly for six months of the year, next time Ogilvy has a board meeting, five people will say, I can't fly to the board meeting because it's in New York and I don't fly in November. What does that mean? It means they've got to install a decent video conferencing alternative for people to attend remotely. Uh, or if you're a Swedish person, to sail there in an ocean-going yacht. Because, <laughs> un you know, unfortunately, Sweden doesn't have very good broadband and the United <laughs> Nations has no video conferencing equipment. I did have a bit of a grumble about that, because you know, it's set an example, right? But set an example that other people can follow, right? I can't really say to Ogilvy, yeah, if you want me to go to that meeting in New York, I demand an ocean-going yacht, right? OK? Now, but the point I'm making is, once you get 10% of the people to adopt anything, what's the biggest predictor, by the way, of anybody drinking Guinness when they enter a pub? The biggest determinant is whether someone's already drinking Guinness in the pub. Okay? I suggested to Guinness you could actually employ people to stand in pubs drinking Guinness, and it would probably pay, and that you would have no shortage of applicants for those jobs. But they didn't seem very interested in this. Okay? What's the single biggest determinant of whether you, have so whether you install solar panels in your house, whether a near neighbour has them? You don't need to get from 0 to 100. In human behavior, if you can get from 0 to 10, 10 to 100 often proves surprisingly easy. Provide everybody with 10 options, get them to choose three, provided that everybody chooses some of them, what you'll find is that the behavioral change then spreads completely naturally through networks, through willing behavior, not through compulsion. And it exploits a very simple human bias, by the way. We like things we've chosen. We hate things that are imposed on us, even if they're the same thing, OK? The very fact that we've chosen something makes us like it. And so, as I said, video conferencing, lots and lots of things like this, they're nothing to do with economics. We need more people to video conference. You can't say it's an economic problem. It's not technological. The technology is really good. It's not economic. It's practically free. Okay? The reasons people aren't doing this are cultural. They're to do with, we need a 10% of people who insist on doing things by video conference, and then suddenly you've broken that social awkwardness of saying, no, I don't want to fly in November. Okay? And all these things, I think, are really important because if you give them to economists, they'll come up with magic free answers. Because the whole basis of economics, by trying to make something look like physics, you've created a science where there's no magic. The fantastic thing about psychology is there's magic all over the place. This TV produces all those colours. No, it doesn't. Your head produces them. The TV is only producing three colours. The reason is that the TV is designed for higher primate perception. The human eye is sensitive to three parts of the light spectrum. The TV, by producing only those three colours, can force your head, by varying the ratio of those three colours, will force your brain to produce the other billion colours. No one's tried to make an objective television. It would cost a fortune. You'd need to have literally every pixel capable of producing every single thing on the spectrum. It's entirely a brain hack, OK? Now, nobody says a TV is immoral because it's not reproducing the light spectrum accurately. So I would argue that something that makes a journey feel shorter isn't cheating simply because it makes a journey feel shorter without reducing its objective duration. I'm basically, I'm kind of cool with mind hacks. Um, and I'll end on this, just to prove my point. By telling a different story about something, you can make good things bad. Ed Sheeran, for example, OK? You can also make bad things good simply by changing what the human brain pays attention to, simply by changing the frame of reference. You know the business where you land at an airport and you're about a mile from the... The, the, the terminal building, and you hear the engines wind down, and everybody on the plane has the same thought, which is, oh, shit, it's going to be a bus, right? And we always feel that, don't we? If it's not an air bridge, we go, they've cheated us again. They've fobbed us off with a sodding bus. <laughs> and I'd always felt like this, and I'd always really resented the bus. And then one day, we land, and the EasyJet pilot, he says, um, now, he said, I've got some bad news and some good news. Now, he waited till we landed. You don't want to hear that at 30,000 feet, OK? <laughs> and he said, I've got some bad news and some good news. The bad news is we won't be able to get you an air bridge because there's a plane blocking our gate. But the good news is, he said, the bus will take you all the way to passport control so you won't have far to walk with your bags. 
And I looked at my companion and I said, that's weird, because come to think of it, that's always true, isn't it? The bus drops you off right next to passport control, so you don't have to walk for sort of three quarters of a mile past loads of Toblerone stands just to get back to your, your luggage. And what he'd done is he'd reframed the bus from being an inconvenience to being a conveyance, because we were looking at the journey from the plane to the airport. And in the getting from the plane to the airport, the air bridge is better. But in getting out of the airport, actually the bus is better. And by just changing what you think about, you can turn a weakness into a strength. And that's what great advertising often does. The top line, Avis is number two in rental cars, that's an ad for Hertz, right? It says that Avis won't have as many cars, won't have as many outlets, probably be more expensive, you won't have as much choice of different car models, okay? But you add the human dimension, you flip it from being an operational consideration to an attitudinal consideration, so we try harder, now it's an ad for Avis, okay? If you look at some of the world's great ad end lines, they actually acknowledge a weakness. Guinness was good things come to those who wait. It's the most tediously slow poor. Bar staff hate it, right? OK, it takes ages to wait for your Guinness. Good things come to those who wait is basically turning a bug into a feature. Um, fresh cream cakes, naughty but nice. That was Salman Rushdie when he worked for Ogilvy and Mather. Um, reassuringly expensive for Stella Artois. Okay? A lot of the great advertising end lines are actually exactly that. They're saying, this is a product weakness until you look at it differently when it actually becomes an advantage. And um, that's the vital thing about psychology. Because perception is relative, I'm going to end with this one film, I hope that's okay. Because perception is totally relative, okay, if you change the context, you change the perception. You don't have to change reality to change what people think about something. You just have to change the context, the frame, or the comparative set in which they consider that thing. How many people here have an espresso machine? Okay. Now, if you had to buy that coffee in a jar, like Nescafe, it would cost you, for an equivalent amount of caffeine, it would cost you about $50 for a jar of Nespresso coffee. The thing is, you don't buy it in a jar, do you? You buy it in a pod. And you don't know what an individual Nescafe costs or an individual Maxwell House, right? So when you put the 49 cent pod into your Nespresso machine, your frame of reference isn't Nescafe, it's Starbucks. You think, well, it's 49p, it would have cost me $3 at Starbucks, this machine's basically saving me money, okay? I've saved, oh look, I've just saved $2.50 by buying this really expensive coffee. Rolls-Royce and Maserati, again, started exhibiting their cars not at car shows, but at boat and plane shows. Because if you're looking at Learjets all afternoon, a $300,000 car is an impulse buy, OK? <laughs> right? Whether something's expensive or cheap, anybody feel guilty buying expensive tea? The weird thing is, if you buy insanely expensive tea, really, really expensive tea, and you make it with tap water, it's a cheaper drink than bottled water. But you feel guilty buying the tea because it's more expensive than cheap tea. So depending on what your frame of reference is, the same thing can be cheap or expensive. I persuaded my father to get Sky. For years, he refused to get any kind of premium television. Uh, he was 88. Uh, he spent most of his life, you know, only paying the TV licence fee in the UK. And then I said, well, it's not £17 a month. I said, it's, uh, it's basically 60p a day. He goes, what difference does that make? I said, you spend £2 a day on newspapers. I said, if you spend £2 a day on newspapers, it's not that weird spending 60p on 200 channels. He went, oh, I suppose you're right. He's now become this complete advocate going, what marvellous value for money it is, and he can't understand why my brother won't get it. <laughs> so genuinely, whether something's even cheap or expensive isn't an absolute. It's entirely the product of comparative framing. Um, so we'll take just a few questions. I had some prepared. I think probably the audience has better questions than, than I had. So um, any burning questions that, that anybody wants to ask? If not, I'll start with mine. OK, yes, over here. Uh, you mentioned earlier that uh, things are either a, uh, a bargain or a treat. Yeah. How do you identify bargain and treat over time, like as tastes and preferences change? Uh, it's, interesting. it's a very, very interesting question, because one of the definitions in nudging in behavioral economics about what's an acceptable nudge is something that people don't regret with hindsight. In other words, if you persuade someone to do something which, with hindsight, they were glad they did, that's considered an acceptable nudge. Now, the only problem with that definition is that we tend not to regret what we do anyway. So we have a thing called adaptive preference formation. Um, and someone actually told me this from retail. They said, when you think about it, OK, <laughs> this is a terrible truth, but it's true. You never regret your extravagances, do you? 
Okay. In fact, you're more likely to enjoy a play if you buy more expensive tickets, not because you have better seats, but you're more reluctant to admit that you didn't enjoy it. Okay. And so there is, I mean, undoubtedly, luxury goods enjoy an extraordinarily easy ride uh, when you look at them. Um, now, there are, there are really interesting debates about, by the way, about luxury goods and fashion. So if you look at the amount the world spends on uh, fashion and beauty products, it's actually more than $3 trillion a year, which is more than the world spends on education. Um, and much of that, I would argue, is kind of rivalrous. That in other words, we don't really have a choice about how, I mean, particularly true of women, I think it's fair to say, isn't it? Men can opt out of fashion, particularly Canadians, because you've got the Canadian tuxedo, haven't you? That fantastic uh, triple denim option. But one of the things that, one of the things that does, do, does concern me is that if you're a woman and you actually don't care about fashion, it's very difficult for you not to make an effort, isn't it? I mean, the social pressure imposed on you to basically participate in fashion is much higher, and likewise cosmetics, if you think about it. I'm going to talk about this endlessly with my daughters. And they go, but if I go out without makeup on, I feel crap. It's not about other people. It's essentially that I'm you know, almost self-medicating by putting this stuff on. You know, there's an emotional effect of doing it. Um, but no, the strange thing about extravagances is that when you buy something that's extravagant or when you take an extravagant holiday, um, you're less likely to regret it, in fact, precisely because you spend a lot of money on it. And so when that retailer, it was actually a fashion retailer who said that to me, you never regret your extravagances. Anybody else, anybody here want to admit, to actually admit to regretting an extravagance? Where they bought a really expensive TV and wish they hadn't or bought a really, and nobody does, do they, really? So, I mean, there is something really strange, and adaptive preference formation is interesting, because what it means is that if you can get people to choose something, they'll generally decide they like it. Um, so one of, one, of the, one of the ways I suggest you could play that trick, by the way, with adaptive preference formation, is if you have something which is either good or bad, the people who are in the bad state can't tell themselves a story about how they're glad they're in that state. Okay, now, let me give an example of this, standing on trains, okay? As the, the way trains are designed, someone asked, how do you reduce train overcrowding? And I said, well, there's another answer to that question, which is, how do you stop people minding standing up? Because if people don't mind standing, I'm not talking about four-hour journeys. I mean, I know in Canada, you know, I'm not talking about standing from Toronto to Medicine Hat or something. <laughs> that would be deeply annoying, okay? Right? But what I'm talking about is 30-minute commuter journeys. Now, the way it currently works is if you sit on a train, you get a view out of the window, you get a table, you get a plug, uh, you get a place to put a laptop, you get a place to put a cup of coffee, you can put a bag underneath the table, okay? You get everything. If you stand on a train, you're in the middle of the aisle, you get no view, you get no table, there's nowhere to put your coffee, uh, there's nowhere to put your bag, um, and in addition, you've got to hold on to something so you can't even read a book or use a mobile phone. Okay? So it's basically sitting is brilliant, standing is shite. Okay? There's no capacity for adaptive preference formation to kick in. Now, I said, if you redesign a train so the seats are inboard, and you get a seat, but you don't get a table, you just get a cup holder, you don't get a view, okay? All you get is a place to sit. And if you stand, you get lots of leaning posts along the windows of the train with a small ledge for a laptop or a tablet. You get two USB chargers. You get a hook to hang your bag on the wall of the train. People will actually choose to stand. Or people forced to stand can tell themselves a story about, actually, I'm glad I'm standing because I can get on with some work on my laptop, right? So if you design a train around two trade-offs rather than win-lose, you can actually increase the sum of human happiness because people in both states can tell themselves a story about how they're glad it turned out the way it did. Does that sound like cheating? Does anybody else agree with me here? I, I had this insight because when I went to college, the first year, everybody was allocated a room that was about equal. Then we had a student ballot, and you could be anywhere between number one and number 200. And the person who was number one got the first pick of rooms in the second year. And the person who was number 200 ended up bloody miles away in a shithole. Okay? But in the third year, it reversed. So the person who was number 200 then became number one. Now, the weird thing I noticed was that every single person was glad about how, they, how it turned out for them because they just told themselves a different story. They said, actually, it's much more important to have a good year in the third year because that's exam year. Or they go, we well, don't want to have a bad room in your second year because, you know, if you have a bad year in your second year, you're miles away, you see. Whereas all the rooms in the third year are kind of okay. 
And then the people who are in the middle went, well, it's great. I'm glad I'm in the middle because I don't get a crap room either year. Okay? And what was fascinating about that is because there was a trade-off between the two, everybody could simply select their frame of reference and choose the frame in which they came out best, therefore maximizing the net sum of happiness. Whereas if, you, if you'd had it where, of course, it was the same both years running, the people at the bottom would have basically gone into revolution, wouldn't they? They would have gone insane. So actually, I think there's a clever way in which you can actually use adaptive preference formation to make more people happy. But I mean, psychological things are really weird like that. And they're some of the things I genuinely don't understand. So someone asked me about road pricing and having premium lanes on roads. Okay. Now, it's very important if you're trying to get to Heathrow Airport in, in the UK and you have to traverse the southwestern section of the M25, if there's a bad traffic jam, it's a disaster. You miss your plane. Now, here's a weird thing, okay? If you just had a premium lane and if there was a traffic jam, you could pay £25, drive in the premium lane and jump the queue. Most people would regard that as socially totally unacceptable, wouldn't they? And I think I would even, you know, trat in a Bentley, just, you know, whizzing past it all. Weirdly, if you did it differently so that you had to book the day before and you paid £5 as insurance, and if there was a jam, your £5 insurance entitled you to drive in the, in, the, in the faster lane to get to Heathrow, weirdly, we wouldn't see that as unfair, would we? So one of the things is that, you know, they often said road pricing is considered totally unacceptable. Again, an economist would say all that matters is how much you pay. Okay? But actually, how you charge has a huge effect on whether people think something is fair or unfair. Coca-Cola created a massive scandal. The guy almost had to resign because he suggested having Coke machines where the price of a Coke went up in hot weather. And people went bananas. And my joke about that was, if you just said the price of a Coke drops in cold weather, everybody would go, that's a great idea. <laughs> so how you describe something is more important than what it is. That's the really strange thing. Great, any, any other questions? Yes, Ash. Um, you had a slide about creative people having to uh, persuade rational people. Yeah. Uh, do you have any tips on doing that? Uh -huh. <laughs> This is what I call the big double standard in business decision making, which is, I'm not suggesting for a second, by the way, creative people should be allowed to just w wander off unpoliced, okay? I'm flying back to London on Sunday, as I said. I don't want to think that the people at Pearson Airport and Air Traffic Control are wildly creative experimental people, you know. I don't want to think that the people who test the wheel nuts on the plane are going, hey, let's try anti-clockwise this time, just, <laughs> you know, just for the lols, right? Okay. So it's very important. I, I don't think it's ridiculous that creative people have to present their ideas for some, by some sort of validation to people more rational and sensible than them, OK? I don't think that's wrong. What is wrong is it never happens the other way around. If you have an engineer and an economist who comes up with a perfectly rational suggestion to something, then that gets enacted without any kind of what you might call uh, creative sense checking or, or creative validation. So if you take something, for example, like the pension tax credit system in the UK, it's a case of something which is economically logical and in marketing or persuasive terms, utterly useless. So we spend in the UK 25 billion a year in tax rebates for, co for pension contributions. To give you a measure of that, that's about a fifth of the cost of the National Health Service. Now, as a way of persuading people to have a pension, Effectively paying tax rebates in real time into the pension fund is as an appalling a use of money as an incentive as you could possibly imagine. Because you've never walked past a mobile phone shop and it says, sign up to this um, uh, tariff now and we'll give you a great handset in 2045 of you, right? Okay. No marketer would ever say, do this now and you'll be rewarded in 30 years' time, okay? Because we discount future gains. Um, now, at the same time as we're spending 25 billion, I've asked 20 people in marketing, I said, which is more effective, complete tax rebates for um, the rest of your life on all your pension contributions versus you sign up to a pension which increases at 3% every year throughout your life and you get a free iPad, <laughs> okay? And all but one of the marketers thought free iPad would be more motivating uh, than the 24 billion we spend uh, on, on that. Now, I'll give you another example of this. Uh, actually, I'll try it for Canadian audience, okay? How many of you, if I gave you 500 um, Canadian dollars and said to you, you can keep that 
provided you've paid $500 into your pension before you get home this evening. How many of you would know how to do it? That's interesting. One, one, two people. Do you work in finance, by the way? No, you, you're an economist. Okay. No, I asked it. I, I promise I'm not making this. I asked that same question, translated to pounds, in the UK to an audience exclusively of people who worked in financial services. One person knew how to do it, and they worked for Goldman Sachs, ironically. Okay. Now, nobody think of this. Okay. Now, a very sensible thing, if anybody gets a windfall, would be to put half your windfall into your pension. Okay. A really sensible thing to do. Nobody does. Why? Because it's impossible. Because I'd have to go home. This is how I'd have to pay £500 into my pension, right? I'd have to go home, ask my wife to find, retrieve something from a filing cabinet. I haven't got a clue where it is, OK? I'd have to find an address, write a cheque for £500. I have no idea where my chequebook is. I haven't written a cheque for six months. Find an address to post it to, I think, in Bristol, right? and write a letter with a load of account numbers explaining what I wanted to do. How would I know they got the money? They wouldn't write and say thanks for the money. No, I'd have to remember in six months' time when I got my pension statement to check that they'd credited the extra £500. OK, now, the reason that's catastrophic, that should be an app. That should be literally, how much do you want to add to your pension this month? OK? If, if, if the government's going to spend £25 billion on incentivising a pension, they could spend... To, you know, half a million pounds on an app that makes it really easy to do. In other words, OK, this month you actually haven't spent all your money, you've got 500 pounds left over, do you want to put any of it into your pension? 300 pounds, bing, right? I've just turned it into 500 or whatever with a tax thing. No, you can't do that. Now, there are two things about it. One, nobody does it because it's difficult. Two, there's a second-order problem in human psychology, which is because it's difficult, we assume we're not supposed to do it. Okay, we go, if this was a normal behaviour, someone would have made this easy. So the fact that I've got to do all this paperwork basically means I'm a weirdo. It's like using moist toilet paper, right? Everybody should use moist toilet paper, agreed? <laughs> right, thank you. The Japanese there, absolutely spot on. Are you, any Japanese there? There must be. But Muslims and the Japanese, quite rightly, r recognise that a toilet should come equipped with some sort of water supply, right? You wouldn't go out in the garden and get mud on your hands repotting a plant and go, oh dear, I've got mud on my hands, let me rub them very vigorously with some dry paper, would you, right? <laughs> but for some reason, when it comes to your rectum, that's fine, OK? <laughs> right? Now, the interesting thing there is, we ask, we ask this question. Now, when you think about it, OK, you go to the shop, your unconscious brain looks at the toilet paper aisle and there's an acre of dry toilet rolls and then there's one thing of moist on the top shelf. And it's blue and white, so it looks medicinal. And it's on its own, and you think that's probably for perverts and people with a medical condition, <laughs> right? But the second you give it a moment's thought, right, you realise that using something moist to clean your bum is so obviously logical that it's weird that we don't do it. Um, it's like solar panels. The reason we don't have solar panels is because our neighbours don't have them. The reason we don't have moist... It's not, a, it's not a rational thing, it's not an economic thing. We're a herd species, you know. We feel disproportionately uncomfortable doing things that people around us don't do. And, you know, so our behaviour is hugely conditioned. That's why the guy standing there with a pint of Guinness is permission for everybody coming into the pub to order a Guinness. And so once you understand those kind of network effects, you realise there are loads of things where sole economic incentives aren't going to work. One of the most potent things, I think, for financial services, by the way, if anybody, anybody in financial services, um, is actually uh, for the employer to become the supplier of financial services. Why? Because we feel comfortable with an investment product which is the same product as everybody else we work with. Why is that? Okay. Well, antelope, the reason they graze in herds isn't because you get better grass that way. You get better grass if you wandered off on your own. But if you wander off on your own, you're going to spend, you spend 20% of your time grazing and 80% of your time looking out for lions, right? Whereas if you're in a herd of antelope, you can spend 95% of your time grazing and 5% of your time you just keep an eye on the most neurotic antelope. And if, if the most neurotic antelope seems relatively relaxed, you can probably chill and get on with a bit of grazing. Now, in the same way, OK, if everybody in Ogilvy has the same pension, to be honest, if they put the charges up, if it starts underperforming, I'm never going to notice, right? But some sad bugger in the finance department will notice, and I'll get to hear about it. And so selling financial products collectively just creates a kind of confidence in people that selling them individually doesn't do. 
And then what economists have done is they've created huge amounts of choice in financial services, which they think benefits people because they assume we're an individual optimizer, not a collective satisficer. Okay? And the huge amounts of choice mean that everybody has a different pension from everybody else, so everybody's frightened about it. And so, you know, there are arguments where the government could step in and say, basically, we're only going to accept these are the 10 pensions, okay? And if anything bad happens to one of those 10 pensions, you're probably going to hear about it, okay? So that's, you know, if you think about it, what, what choice does in financial services products is it allows financial services providers to play kind of divide and rule, you know, because there's no collective information uh, mechanism that's why everybody, in 1950, the reason everybody trusted their bank was because everybody knew the bank manager, the bank manager knew everybody, but there was a third dimension, which is the bank manager knew that everybody knew everybody else. So he only had to get caught out cheating one person on their home contents insurance, and his reputation was toast in the whole town. So he couldn't afford to deviate. The second a bank became something that operated 200 miles away and you were account holder 109763, that basic mechanism of human solidarity keeping people in power honest breaks down. Now, do you want me to get a bit Brexity for a second? Okay. Um, if you think about it, there's no mechanism in a unit of 27 countries where you could ever, speaking about 23 different languages, where you could ever get a democratic movement to kick out the people in power. Because the 27 different countries are too, are, are too ill-connected to actually, f whatever you think about, okay, about American politics, okay, every four or eight years, they completely purge the governmental class, don't they? They have a change in mood, they go, these people have run out of ideas, they become corrupt, everybody goes, okay? It's never gonna happen in Europe, because they're 25 different languages, they're 25 different media, there's no capacity for a collective mood to sweep that continent going, okay, we've had enough of these people, we want different people. And so the people in power can then play divide and rule between those different cells. And what used to happen is, you know, the bank manager couldn't play divide and rule because there was a, a, an unconscious solidarity between all their customers where they collectively kept him honest. And so it's only when you understand, you know, I'm, by the way, as I said, I'm 50-50 on the Brexit question, but the idea that there are no reasons to object to the European Union is just as ridiculous as the idea that it's wholly evil and, and um, badly intentioned. As a democratic mechanism, it's, it's deeply flawed because there isn't that self-correction mechanism uh, in it. And by the way, Americans, the best one, by the way, is Americans who go, you're ridiculous choosing Brexit. I go, you wouldn't even pay a fucking tax on tea, you ungrateful <laughs> bastards. Okay? So anyway, so if any Americans, you know, come across a bit anti-Brexit, just remind them of that one, right? Great. So I think we'll, mm. we'll leave it there. So please uh, join me in, in thanking Rory for showing up and for... Pleasure. Thank you. Absolute pleasure.